Good evening. Uh, welcome to our uh, Lessons of Vietnam, uh, brought to you by North Carolina Vietnam Veterans Incorporated. I am Bill Dixon. My co-host, Mr. Bob Matthews, will be on uh, shortly. We are uh, honored to very uh, special guest tonight, uh, uh, Brigadier General uh, Norman Gaddis, uh, part of our POW series. We've had uh, some great stories and so forth, and you're looking uh forward to hope tonight for some more great stories. Uh, General Gaddis was uh, born in Dandridge, Tennessee. He enlisted in the United States Army Air Corps in October of 1942. He served in the United States Army Air Force from 1942 to 1945. And then he got out and went into the reserves, Air Force Reserves from 1945 to 1949. And then went back, he was brought back into the Air Force from 1949 to 1976. Of course, he took a little bit of a vacation during that period of time. He was uh, 2,123 days the guest of uh, at the Hanoi Hilton in Hanoi, uh, Vietnam being in 1966 to 1973. Uh, he had uh, 73 combat missions. That's a lot of combat missions, General, before, before they finally got with you. And uh, 73 combat missions uh, before he got shot down, he was... Um, uh, flying along with uh, some bombers, I, I guess doing escort duty or es- escorting some fighters into oh, Hanoi. Oh, okay. And uh, they were hit by uh, shrapnel from uh, uh, probably from a missile that uh, blew up. His uh, navigator sitting in the back seat, uh, James Jefferson. Uh, uh, ejected before he did, and then he ejected. Uh, and when he landed, uh, General Gaddis landed, uh, he had a welcome committee uh, of uh, North Vietnamese there to pick him up, and just a short time later, he was at the Hanoi Hilton. Uh, that, that's a little bit of background I wanted to give you. Uh, what we'd like for you to do is call in at 919-518-9773 and ask the general some questions, make some comments, or whatever you'd like to talk about. We're willing to talk about it as long as it's Vietnam-oriented. Uh, call in again, 919-518-9773 to Lessons of Vietnam and talk with us. Uh, General, I, in my notes here, I said with the season when you retired, you had 4,300 hours flying time. That's a lot of time in the air. Well, that's, that's quite a few hours, uh, <clears throat> but... I had to go through, I did go through the Air Force educational system through the Air University Command at Maxwell Air Force Base. So I spent a year there in school, and then it was my good luck, good fortune to go to the National War College, the class of 1966. So I had two hour, two years of schooling plus four years of duty in the Pentagon where you do limited, limited amount of flying time. So considering the fact that when I was in the fighter squadrons, I flew as much or more than, than most people. And uh, so I, was, I, I felt very, very fortunate in being able to fly, go from the propeller airplanes of the, the P-40, and the P-51, then into the P-47, and then move into jets and move right on up through the T-33s, the F-84s, F-86s, F-100s, and then eventually ending up in the F-4 Phantom airplane. So uh, I was I was fortunate to be in a position to fly uh, whenever I wanted to, and. Uh, I took advantage of that every opportunity that I could. You also served in quite a few command uh, positions where you commanded the whole group? or Yes. <clears throat> I was the director of operations for the Fighter Weapons School at Nellis Air Force Base. That was one of my uh, most enviable tours, I guess. And then I had an opportunity to, when I went to Vietnam, I went there realizing that at Cameron Bay was one of the busiest airports in all of Vietnam. And the regular director of operations, Colonel McNeil, he and I were classmates and had been friends for many, many years. We worked out an arrangement whereby 
Colonel McNeil would be the operator, <coughs> director of operations from 6 in the morning until 6 in the evening. I would be the operations officer from 6 o'clock in the evening until 6 o'clock in the morning. Uh, after I finished my tour of duty, then I could catch a bit of sleep and then go up and fly combat missions, and that's, what, that's how I was able to, to uh, complete 73 missions. Now, uh, out of the 73 missions, were you ever uh, hit in the process of uh, doing your combat missions before they actually uh, knocked you out of the air? No, no. I was shot at many times, but fortunately I was not hit, mm -hmm. either by small arms fire when we were doing close air support work or the uh, anti-aircraft guns out of, around Hanoi. Fortunately, I was never hit by any of that. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, one of the things I had asked you all the way when, when I, earlier was, you told me that the plane was uh, had been hit and was kind of tumbling through the air. Yes. Uh, it must have been uh, tough to eject out of a tumbling airplane like that. And it it was it was. I uh, told my pilot James Jefferson to go out. And I heard two explosions, the first one being his canopy was blowing off. Secondly was his seat going out, and the airplane and was tumbling through the air, and I went out uh, upside down, about 2,000 feet above the ground. That sounds like a long ways, but not when you got to get out of a, a seat and it'll get, open up a parachute. Well, it, it all happens very quickly and automatically. I... Uh, was able then to, as I drifted down in my parachute, to pull out my cell, my phone and tell them that I was okay. And uh, by the time I put the phone back in, uh, <clears throat> I hit the ground. And by this time, about 10 soldiers with guns surrounded me, and I put my arms up and decided not to play John Wayne and was captured. Now, any of them speak English at all? No. Uh, they but, didn't speak English. But they could pretty much tell you what they wanted uh, with the... Uh, yes, just uh, at one time I irritated them by trying to get up out of the back of the pickup truck that I was in, and the soldier <clears throat> took his pistol and put it at my forehead, and I immediately began to understand Vietnamese. Didn't have any problem at all understanding that. Mm -hmm. But uh, they did not harass me, at least while we were waiting to see if we could find what happened to my crew member. And as a matter of fact, uh, the first bit of kindness that was uh, given to me was the fact that this young man took out his first aid kit, and I had a long cut on my right elbow. He bandaged that up and uh, using his equipment and stopped the blood bow. Uh, you told me that uh, when you got to Hanoi Hilton, they gave you a, a special, uh, a, a special uh, period of time. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, when you first got to Hanoi Hilton and how they treated you. And first <clears throat> went in and they stripped my flying suit off. They had already taken my boots from me. They realized that American pilots had soft feet and they couldn't run on the hard rocks up there, so they took my shoes first and then my flying suit. And that left me with just an undershirt, a pair of shorts, and they placed me on a small stool and three interrogators began to ply me with questions and ask me to give them information, and I told them that I could only give them my name, rank, serial number, and date of birth. And they became very much agitated and irritated because I would not give any more than that. And uh, they continued to, for the next hour, just to ply me with questions, and, and I told them that I could not answer the questions or I would not answer the questions. And that's when they began the torture process. You said it was like 64 hours of... The interrogation took place over a 64-hour period, and they would not let me sleep. They, when the, they would stop their questioning, they would put me on a small stool, a very low stool, and uh, I would have to sit there. They threatened to kill me if I went to sleep, so uh, obviously I was not going to sleep. So 
it, uh, when it all ended up, I listened to some church bells, or at least some bells up to the north of the prison that I could hear. And I then figured out that I'd been there 64 hours in, in the interrogation and was uh, without sleep. Uh, and then they put you in a, in a uh, cell by yourself uh, for how long? I was in the cell. It was seven feet square, had two concrete beds, and then just a small distance between the two concrete beds to walk up and down. And I was in that cell for a thousand and four consecutive days mm. without seeing in any other American. Well, I did see one American for about ten seconds, and I remembered him as being one of my students going through the fighter weapons school. But uh, beyond that, I didn't see any Americans, and they kept me more or less isolated. And as one of the reporters said, they were trying to hide me in the area of the prison that we referred to as Heartbreak Hotel. Those uh, eight cells there were for people who had been severely injured and people who were non-cooperative as far as interrogation was concerned. You were uh, you were one of the ranking officers, I believe, that were, was there. I was the first full colonel captured in North Vietnam. However, I was well aware of the fact that Robbie Reisner, who was shot down in September of 1965, Robbie was promoted to colonel in the fall of 1965, and I knew that. But as far as the rank at the time we were captured, I was the first full colonel captured in North Vietnam. And uh, uh, from everything I've read and so forth, that everybody uh, reflects back that because of the uh, uh, chain of command that y'all established and kept going with Stockdale and them that started, and y'all kept it going, that, that was one of the main things that kept, uh, gave prisoners uh, the support and the strength to, to, to hold out and keep going on. I think it was. I think it's very, very important to those who are under you to exude that confidence and that leadership and uh, to make sure that everyone was doing what they were supposed to be doing. And, and in most cases up there, it was like that. Everyone... We looked out for one another. We passed information to one another using a tap code that had been devised by some of the early uh, people who were captured. Mm -hmm. And so we used that as a means of corresponding with one another. Eventually, uh, people who were in the Hanoi Hilton were taken to other prisons. There was 10 other camps around Hanoi. And so they would move people out to those camps and then bring them back to Hanoi and then move them to another camp. So using the code that we had, the TAP code, we were able to spread a lot of information. And we also, I think, uh, gave a lot of confidence to them as far as leadership was concerned. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, when you were, you were there... Uh, your wife, you've lost your wife, but I, I heard her speak one time that uh, you were a POW for about three years before she knew that it, whether you were alive, alive or, or anything about you. Yes, it was almost three years from the time I was captured until she received a letter. I had the opportunity to write a letter at Christmas time. They did soften their views slightly and allowed us to write at Christmas time, if we were not uh, really irritating them. So after the third year, I, I, after the third Christmas there, I was able to write to her, and uh, she received the letter. After she read the letter, she advised Air Force Intelligence that she had received the letter. They questioned her and asked her if, do you recognize his handwriting? And the answer was yes. Uh, would he be saying those words if he were in the States? And she said, yes, those definitely, but the letter came from him. So uh, that gave her a great deal of relief, and she was able then to pass that information on to the other members of my family. Mm -hmm. 
Was she involved with the other wives of the POWs? Yes, she was. She was the National League of Families. She was the state coordinator for North Carolina. And there were about 80 families in North Carolina whose loved ones were either killed in action, missing in action, or prisoners of war. Mm -hmm. And she usually made contact with those people at least once a month to bring them up to date on information that she had received from the Department of Defense and the Air Force and other sources. Uh, and it was difficult. She visited with many of the families and, and uh, shared information with them and cried with them. And uh, it, was <clears throat> it was just something that she brought, seemed to bring strength to those people who were hurting. They were, they were anxious to get anything that was official and, and seemed to be uh, at least in their favor. Uh, and and it, was, it was a hard job for her mm -hmm. and, and these families. They traveled to Washington several times to be briefed by the Department of Defense POW Task Force and Regrettably, some of the families from North Carolina had not traveled very much. They were not used to being in a big city, and so she took it upon herself to encourage them to come and go with her so that she could share with them firsthand the information that they had concerning prisoners. And I think that brought a great deal of strength to those families. Well, I know that uh, what the, the brief time that I, I got to know, meet her and so forth, she uh, seemed like a very strong, very strong lady. And we sometimes forget, uh, you know, we look at you as a POW, but she was back home and uh, and she didn't suffer the torture that you did, but she uh, she still suffered and, and, and she was a, almost a POW herself to circumstances. Yes, yeah, it was, it was very, very difficult for the families to undergo uh, a, a, an experience like that. And her, she felt that what she ought to do was to help relieve that anxiety as best that she possibly could. And so she, uh, she liked the, the job. It, it was difficult, but, and it kept her busy rather mm -hmm. than to sit at home and worry and so forth. She tried to make the best of everything and then pass that uh, spirit on to the other people who were uh, waiting for some word, some word of their family. Well, I know she was a, a, a strong uh, support for those other families and so forth. Uh, let me, I, in my notes and so forth, when I was trying to make sure that I had uh, uh, background a little bit tonight, I, you were involved with the first jet flight across the Pacific Ocean in some way? Yes, I was in 1952. I was assigned to the 31st Fighter Wing out of Albany, Georgia, and uh, we were given the opportunity to fly across the Pacific Ocean. Colonel David Schilling was our wing commander, and at that time I was a captain, just a brand new captain. And I had never done any air refueling, so the operations officer said, uh, I'll take it, uh, uh, you, you fly my wing, and I will describe how this is going to take place. And so we took off. After we took off, <coughs> he said, uh, I have problems with my airplane. I have to go back. So I went up and taught myself how to do air-to-air -air refueling. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and it worked out that uh, I, I didn't have any problem. I, I, I did the hookups, and it was a nice day. And so <clears throat> it turned out that on the 4th of July, 1952, the entire wing, and that was 62 airplanes, took off 30 minutes between squadrons, and we flew nonstop to California. Uh, we refueled out over Wink, Texas at about 14,000 feet. Everyone refueled and everyone landed in California. After we checked the weather, uh, it turned out that uh, there were some strong headwinds from coming in from Hawaii. 
<clears throat> and we found out that we could not all refuel off of one set of tankers on the same day. It just couldn't be done. We didn't have enough time. The tankers didn't have enough fuel. So they stretched it out so that the first squadron left Hawaii, left <coughs> California, and they refueled without any problem and went on to California. The second day, uh, another squadron went. On the third day, my squadron went, and everyone refueled without any problem. We landed in Hickam and stayed there for a couple of nights. From there, we flew up to... Uh, Midway and uh, stayed there for a night, <clears throat> uh, stopped off at Wake Island and refueled, and then spent the night at a, a small island out there, had a 6,000-foot airstrip uh, called Intawetok. Intawetok was the atomic energy testing base, and uh, we couldn't take off with a full load of fuel unless we used jet-assisted takeoff. So everyone got a quick lesson in how to use the JADO, and we took off from there, flew to Guam. After we arrived at Guam, we had about six of the airplanes. They had to change the engines because of the coral that was in the runway at Etowetok. It just uh, really tore up the engines, and uh, I guess we were fortunate because between the end of week, Doc, and Guam, 1,400 miles, and you wonder, you know, whether your engine's going to hold up <laughs> to go 1,400 miles, but we made it, and we changed out the engines and stayed two nights at Guam. From there, we went to Iwo Jima, and uh, in the process of landing at Iwo Jima, one of our most experienced pilots, a, a lieutenant colonel who was flying with us, he had about 6,000 hours of flying time. His engine failed, and he ejected from the airplane, but the seat and the parachute never separated, and so he fell to the ground and was, and was killed there at uh, Iwo Jima. We refueled. And then from Iwo Jima, we flew in to Tokyo uh, with 58 airplanes. Uh, quite a sight. Mm -hmm. So that was that was our big accomplishment, and, and that was in 1952. 52. Yes. Yeah. Well, let me go back a little bit to about you. Were, you were uh, uh, born in Dandridge, Tennessee. Yes. And where's Dandridge? Northeast of Knoxville, about uh, probably... 25 miles. So you grew up in the mountains? I, I grew up, I was born on my father, grandfather's farm, and uh, so was my brother. I had an older brother, a year and a half older, and we were both born there on the farm. After uh, living on his farm for quite some time, then my father took a job in Knoxville, Tennessee, and so I actually went to school and then grew up. Uh, I, Knoxville is my home, as I, I recall, and so that's uh, that's my attachment to Tennessee. Yeah. All right. Uh, again, I want you to call in and ask questions or whatever at 919-518-9773. Uh, I'm going to have Bob step in and uh, ask some questions and, and talk with General Gaddis in just, in just a moment. I uh, just want to bring you up a couple of dates. March 29th is National Vietnam Veterans Day. Uh, North Carolina Vietnam Veterans will be meeting at the Raleigh Capitol to hold a, uh, our uh, POW ceremony at 6 o'clock. Uh, that's a Saturday night. And then our uh, normal uh, first Saturday of the month will be April, t uh, April 1st at 12 o'clock noon, the one we've been doing for 27 years. And uh, on March 26th, our show uh, here will be uh, Carrie Turner. Uh, Carrie was the cousin of Joseph Hargrove. Joseph Hargrove was one of the uh, Marines that uh, was left on the island at Kong Tong uh, after the Ameriquez incident. Uh, but uh, Carrie has written a book about looking for uh, Joseph Hargrove's remains and so forth. He will be our guest. Uh, so I know you want to tune in for that. And uh, next we'll have uh, Mr. Bob Matthews come over, our uh, educational czar. And uh, he'll be uh, visiting with, with the General Gaddis. And
Welcome back to the Lessons of Vietnam, Part 2. My name is Bob Matthews, and our special guest tonight is General Norman Gaddis, retired Air Force. General, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's a privilege Thank to meet you again. You. Yes. We met before at the past when you were speaking down in Raleigh at the uh, dedication of our uh, statue, or the yes. anniversary, I should say. Well, first thing I'd like to do is, again, thank you for your service for this country and what you've done for this nation. Thank you. Thank you. And one of the things we've tried to do with Lessons of Vietnam over the years, I think you probably know, Bill probably told you that I'm a retired teacher, mm -hmm. and we've, we've done quite a bit of work over the last few years with the Vietnam curriculum. But one of the things, sir, that we were unable to fulfill and answer questions was the POW issue. Mm -hmm. And I, I mentioned before to you, sir, uh, Mr. Bill Schutte and some other POWs who I've met over the years were kind enough to share their experience with me and the other veterans, and we then took it to the classroom. Right. And one thing we'd like to do, and I know this is very difficult, but um, the chance for someone to call in, or at least listen to you and I tonight talk, is a chance I'll never have again. Mm -hmm. Because most of the time in education, whether it be college or high school, you are taught by someone who is a, a secondary uh, learner of the, of the, uh, of the event. Yes. Rarely do you have someone that lived what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. That's why we want to take advantage of, of your experience tonight and talk about what went through your mind when you were... How long were you in prison again, sir? 2,124 days. Wow. You know, some of, the, some of the questions that came up, the best way I tried to do it in the classroom was to have the students try to train, change places with you. Let them think of what they would do how they would handle things once you told your story mm -hmm. about how you were shot down first half of the show, mm -hmm. what happened to you when you got there, and then when reality set in, and we hear a lot about different POWs over the years, that the strongest part of their uh, captivity was their mental strength. Right. Can mm -hmm. you do a little bit with that with us? Yes. <clears throat> um, after 64 hours of interrogation, brutal interrogation, in which I, I lost consciousness a couple of times. And uh, there was some question in my mind as to how long I could survive something like that, that brutal, brutal treatment. Certainly. And uh, <clears throat> once the interrogation ended and they put me into a, a cell, uh, of course, I wanted to sleep. That was my first thing, is to try to get some sure. rest. But the remainder of the time when I was awake is my thought was, you know, how am I going to survive this ordeal? Certainly. And uh, I, I did not want to compromise uh, any of uh, my principles, and, and I wanted to, to live by the code of conduct. Uh, I knew that. I'd gone through survival school a couple of times, and I knew how important it was to draw strength from what I'd learned in, in those schools. And so it's just almost a daily, almost an hourly uh, <clears throat> bit of work studying, thinking deeply about, can I survive this? Can I survive this and still fulfill my requirement as a military person? Well, well, sir, before today's show, I, I did a lot, not a lot of reading, but substantial reading on your background. And Bill has mentioned before uh, your long history in the service. And he's mentioned your, your, uh, your wife and your, and, and your family. When you came home from Vietnam, what was it like coming home and how were you received? Well, <clears throat> Probably, uh, from what I gather after talking to many Vietnam veterans, we were treated as heroes. And you should have uh, been. And, and, well, I don't, I, I really don't consider myself as a hero. I, I, I went through some tough times, and there are other people who have also gone through tough times, but the main thing is that I wanted to come through with honor. I did not Absolutely. want to bend in and give them information of any kind or to give them any indication that I had any feelings for what was going on in the war. I knew that they were losing a lot of people. Sure. I knew that they were 
just on the brink of, of disaster themselves. But I, other than the people who gave me first aid treatment on my arm and another young man who came in to visit with me and and he looked at my legs and, and he began to cry when he wow. found out that uh, this was caused by the interrogation. I drew support from that, from the fact sure. that that young man cried, that sure. he was a, a decent human being. That was not the case with the guards. They were hard-nosed. Uh, they... <laughs> They didn't hesitate at all to, to slam you in the kidney and, or to take their knee and hit you in the backside with that. And it just, it was difficult to put all of that together and to think about, okay, I'm going to get home. Sometimes I'm going to get out of here. And I kept telling them that. They, I said, I will go home. I will go home. The, the interrogators would ask me, do you think you will ever go home? Yes, I will go home. And I will go home with honor. There you go. Yes. And that was it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. General, I know, as Bill mentioned, you were shot down with a young man named James Jefferson. Yes. And I, I read it in, in the bio that you were given some uh, remnants of his uniform and a dog tag. So you kind of knew they had him or he was somewhere in Vietnam. Yes. You both, you both <coughs> survived the ejection. Yes. Yes. Now, later... <coughs> When he, his remains were found and identified. Yes. <clears throat> He's on the wall, correct? Yes, he is on the wall. Yes, he is. Yes. Now, sir, have you had the opportunity to go to the wall and write his name? Yes, I have. I have. And, of course, I <clears throat> was fortunate when I came back to the States. I went to the hospital, Andrews Air Force Base up in Maryland. Mm -hmm. And his family came during the time that I was being... <clears throat> interrogated by our intelligence people and so I took two days to sit and talk with his family and Wonderful. to give them <clears throat> every bit of information that I possibly could and what I kept <clears throat> emphasizing to them was I saw his helmet I saw his name tag his name tag had been cut out <clears throat> and I saw his clipboard all of those items were clean they were not bloody. They didn't have any oil. They didn't have any burn marks on them. So he got out of the airplane. It's exactly. And, and that, that's what I told them. He got out of the airplane. Now, what happened to him after that, I don't know. But uh, <clears throat> the POW task force working out of Hawaii, they went back to the rice paddy that we actually, the airplane actually crashed in. Okay. And <clears throat> they went there 10 times and dug and dug. Uh, the first thing they found was a tooth. And they sent the tooth to the laboratory in Hawaii. And the dentist took a look at his records and said that could be his tooth. I see. So with that bit of information, the tooth was the first thing that was found. Then they went back and dug 10 times. This time they found human remains. And they sent those to Hawaii to the lab. They were analyzed, and DNA said those were his remains. Now the family, his brother was a major general, I see. Air Force. They were the first two brothers to graduate from the Air Force Academy. Wow. Yeah. It's and amazing, isn't it? Yes, it is. But they're wonderful people. The family just wonderful. But they wanted, they asked the Air Force, do you mind if we have a commercial company do a DNA test? And so the Air Force said, fine. A commercial company did the DNA test. They came up with the same conclusion. Yes, those were his remains. All of that took place 32 years after we bailed out of the airplane. 32 years? 32 years. So after that, they had a memorial service, and it was conducted in, in Washington. Uh, they invited me to come and to be part of the eulogy. I had that opportunity. And so I have visited with his family several times and sta wonderful. still stay in contact with them. Now, that, that was my next question. That, was, that must have given him a tremendous amount of closure. 
Well, I think it did. It, brought, it brought some closure to them after yes. all of those years to know that his remains were not still in Vietnam. His remains had actually been brought back to the States, and now they were buried down in Florida next to his father. His father passed away sometime, I think, in the early 1990s, and so James's remains were buried in Florida with his father and his mother. And you also attended that service? No, I didn't go to Florida. I no. didn't go. I didn't know when it was going to take place, so I did not go down there, but I was, I felt honored that they would allow me to be a part of the, the team that did, yes. did the eulogy for James. Very nice. He was a handsome young man. It, it was, it, <clears throat> he was just about the same age as my son. Mm -hmm. well, sir, a lot of the questions that came up in, in the classroom about the POW ordeal, mm -hmm. as Bill mentioned, you guys went through hell. Yes. And no one can appreciate that. That's why we want to take advantage on this show tonight for someone listening or want to call in at 919-518-9773 and ask uh, General Gaddis any questions you may have. But one of the questions that the kids asked me in school was they heard <clears throat> that you guys developed a tap code yes. on how to communicate. And I was trying today to do it. Mm -hmm. Now, I know it's a five five-letter box or something. Yes. Would you mind giving us a brief synopsis of the TAP code? Well, okay. The alphabet, we divided it into 25 instead of 26 letters. 26 letters, okay. So, so the letter K was not used. No K. So we'd use a C instead of a K. I got you. So you would tap this out. So you go across the top, visualize it, a chart, A, B, C, D, E. First line. F, G, H, so forth. I got you. And so the first sound that you would hear would be which row, these five rows, you had five rows. Five rows. Yeah. Five rows. Yeah. Yeah. Which row it was in. So let's just say you're going to have a C. Okay. That's C. <laughs> and great. That's C. Yes. The first sound is the row. First sound is the row. And then C. The letter. Yes. Okay. So that was one of the one of the POWs had gone to a survival school and uh, he had been taught that code. And as he <clears throat> sat there in the prison he realized that hey, we we could use this. Sure. We could use it tapping. We could even use it by coughing. Coughing, sure. Yes. We could use it if they let you outside and told you to sweep the walk. You could sweep you the You could boom. sweep the code. <laughs> that is very cool. <laughs> that is very cool. <laughs> and so we could pass those. Then even we we'll use the semaphore. You know? <laughs> Going up through a hole in the ceiling. I got you. Uh, we'd put a, a, a white cloth or something on that. We'd stick it up there. And that we passed the code that way. So we had in and on on the back of our they brought our food in large pails. <clears throat> and so sometimes if we had uh, access to uh, a nail or something like this, you could write on the back of the cooking utensils, you know, information. Sure. <laughs> so and the next guy so, would check it out. Yes. Very nice. Yeah. Very nice. Yeah. That's well, how texting started. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, sir, we had talked before about um, how close you guys became as POWs, never seeing one another. Uh -huh. So let's let's take it years later. You come home, <clears throat> you have survived this ordeal. Mm -hmm. And as Bill mentioned, that I call you a hero. Uh -huh. And I, I want you to be comfortable with that. But your wife, who I've met, lovely lady, Thank and you. all the wives of the Vietnam veterans, especially the POWs, <clears throat> went through hell. Yes, they their, did. Their imagination, they which did. I was telling the kids in school, I said, as Vietnam veterans, we, we survived Vietnam, but it was in front of us. Mm -hmm. They survived Vietnam in their imagination. It mm -hmm. must have been 10 times as bad. Mm -hmm. So right. when you got back, sir, after communicating with stone walls, the tap code, how close did you stay with your fellow POWs after you were back? Well, we, we stayed, I would say, very close. 
well, we have a POW network. On, sure. Uh, and so that information is passed back and forth. We uh, still still occasionally have the reunions. They have the okay. 40th reunion out at the Nixon Library in, in California. That, that, Of course, our biggest reunion was the one in Washington where uh, there was 1,200 people there at that dinner at the, the, big, the, at big, the, at the White House. Yeah, the big uh, Nixon dinner. Right, uh-huh. uh-huh. And then it was repeated out in California this year, at the, uh, the past year, at the 40th anniversary. So I there's that, still yeah. a strong, strong bond between us. We rarely ever have time to, to see these people personally, but we keep in touch with them by... Emails by letters. Uh, well, sir, I, I I called the name I mentioned earlier to you. I called Mr. Bill Shooty. Okay. You said you knew of Bill, but you don't know Bill personally. No, I don't know him personally. I just know that he was uh, <clears throat> Jerry Denton's bombardier navigator. Yes, he was. Uh huh. Yes. And, cool. uh, Bill was on the show. I met Bill a, a, a few years ago, and the oddest thing that happened with Mr. Bill Shooty <clears throat> is when he was captured and shot down and ejected. His flight helmet it became a piece of war booty. Yes. And it ended up in a Moscow museum mm-hmm. on the shelf. Yes. And this justice of peace from Arizona, of all places, happened to be touring Moscow. Uh-huh. And he saw this helmet. Well, the name was, you know, embossed in the helmet. Yes. Well, Bill Schuette's name is spelled very differently. Yes. It's T-S-C-H-U-D-Y. Mm-hmm. Well, that struck a bell with the guy. He goes back, investigated, and found Bill, of all places, in Apex, North Carolina. Uh, yes. <laughs> and I'm teaching school at Apex. Uh-huh. And I'm teaching school in Raleigh, and we're putting this Vietnam course together. And I was looking for um, men and women that could help me, mm-hmm. help talk to the kids, because I could tell them about what I did in Vietnam, but not what they did. Yes. So we started to build this clientele of speakers. Mm-hmm. Well, we got a whole bill. It was like finding a Fort Knox mm-hmm. of information. Yes. And Mr. Shooty is watching now, I believe, because he said, when are you going to be on? Uh-huh. And he may, I, I hope he, he'll be calling in soon, uh-huh. or he may just watch and listen, and he may contact you. Well, I hope say, he will. Just to have lunch or something like yes, that. I hope that he will. Compare some notes. Uh-huh. A very, a very nice man. Yes. And, sir, my, my, my next question deals more with, with uh, coming home, and I read this before that almost every POW um, dreams of something and it visualizes it with all their time, solitude, like building a home in their mind playing in the World Series, yes. doing something that they always wanted to do, and yes. they actually do it. Yes. Did you have anything like this that you did? Yes, I did. Yeah, I built a home in my mind. You built a home? Yes. Good. And when I got home, I had my wife to sit down, and I drew this out for her. And she said, hmm, you know, that's that's all well and good, but <laughs> you're, you're now said so to, to go from... From the living room to the kitchen, you have to go through a formal dining room. So that's not a good idea. But okay. uh, the rest of the house, I'll buy that. So, but that is, yes, I visualized that. I I'd never been in construction work before, but I you know, I could visualize that. And and we did together. We supervised the building of a, a wonderful home and lived there for 18 years until I moved to to Durham. Uh huh. Yes. That's great. But it's just something to keep your mind busy, sure. occupied. And we swap those ideas among ourselves as we lived with different people. I was, <clears throat> I guess, restricted more than other people. I only lived with eight other people. But uh, the uh, many of the people were sent out to these other outlying persons sure, sure. For, for a period of time. And then eventually, and I think it was 1972, they were taken to a new prison up near the China border. I see. Uh, that was about 250 miles north. So I think there, there was close to 200 people taken up there. So we, <clears throat> we missed those people and, and, sure. and were anxious when the news came that we were going to be released. Then they came back from the prison up near China and were put in groups according to the date they were captured. The The rule was that 
first the sick and wounded yes. would be released first. The Vietnamese would not abide by that. They would not abide by it. And the second was you were <clears throat> be released according to the date of your capture. I understand. Your shoot down, your capture. Sure. And uh, so that's the way that we they put us into five different groups as we came out. And uh, I got to see a lot of people that I'd never never seen before. Some of them had been down in South Vietnam and had been brought all the way from South Vietnam through the jungles, taking three years to arrive up in Hanoi. Wow. Uh, and so uh, it was it was nice to be with those people, to meet them. Uh, at was, least yeah. if we were only there uh, in, uh, like we were at uh, out in the Philippines for about two to three nights, and there was a lot of activity as we got physical checks and dental checks and new clothing and a chance to do some shopping in a big PX. Wow. <laughs> uh, we, uh, we did all of those things, sure. and, and it, was, it was just gratifying to be able to be with those people. I bet it was. Yes. One other thing that I uh, should mention. Sure. We drew a lot of inspiration from some of the <clears throat> foreigners who were with us. There was three people from Thailand. They had been captured working with U.S. troops and U.S. forces. And in the cell next to mine in the Heartbreak Hotel was a young Vietnamese pilot. And I didn't realize for a long time that he could speak English. Wow. But he and I started a conversation, and then we got called. And so he was, he was tortured. Uh, bitterly for yeah. for doing that, uh, but uh, we nicknamed him Max, and finally Mr. Ross Perot sent his team over to Saigon. This was after things quieted down. The troops, all of the POWs came back. And Mr. Ross Perot sent a team over to Saigon. They located Max and his family and brought him to the states. Wow, that's yes. a great story. Yes, huh? But uh, when I asked him, do you speak English? He said, yes. I said, where'd you learn English? He said, I went through flying school at Randolph Air Force Base in Texas. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sir, well, would you mind going over your, would you mind going over your plane with us? Huh? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. You want me to tell you about this airplane? I would love you to. Yes, that, that is an F-4 Phantom Jet. We used those as uh, bombing airplanes. <clears throat> we carried different types of ordnance on them, but we also had to carry two fuel tanks out here. These are 375-gallon fuel tanks. And if we were going up into the Hanoi area, we carried a 600-gallon tank here. Wow. Yeah. Then in addition to that, we could carry three 750-pound bombs here, three 750-pound bombs there. So you drop the bombs, uh, you drop the center line tank after we cross the Black River going toward Hanoi. Everyone jettisoned those things. So there's enough aluminum up there that those people should make <laughs> drinking cups for the next century. <laughs> and uh, then we'd, we'd drop the ordnance when you were dropping ordnance, and we would drop the ordnance up there and then come back. Uh, that airplane was a, a real workhorse. It carried a tremendous load. Uh, two or three times I took off with the airplane grossing out at 60,000 pounds. That's just about maximum. Mm -hmm. the, the two engines on it with afterburners put out about 30,000 pounds of uh, thrust. So we could get off. It was, it was a workhorse for sure. us coming out of both Thailand and Vietnam. That's one of, one of the most wonderful airplanes. And then the thrill of flying that airplane came after I went through combat crew training school. They took everything off the bottom except these missiles that are embedded in there, and they let us go up and do a maximum speed run with it. So took off from Tampa, climbed out over the Gulf of Mexico, pointed the airplane toward Mexico, pushed the throttles up all the way forward, 
and you 600 I mean 1625 miles an hour and then you'd see <laughs> the you see the windscreen down here turn red <laughs> that tells you to slow down you're smoking <laughs> you're smoking you're smoking <laughs> yeah you're smoking so <laughs> oh, slow boy. down that's amazing it's a it's a wonderful airplane and it was a good working airplane for us in in Vietnam very good yes well, well sir I, I saved a, a couple of tough questions for you all right I can tell you you have spoken a lot all over the country. Yes. Yes. Well, sir, looking back now, we're in a little bit of a foreign policy dilemma now, as you well know, and there's a, a school of thought that I brought up with some other people, and if this question makes you uncomfortable, please don't answer it. All right. What do you feel about trading POWs for POWs? Because we have a man that's pretty well known named Bowie Bergdahl. Yes. Is a um, one the news, everything. We think he's a prisoner of war in Afghanistan or Pakistan. Mm -hmm. And they want to trade some people from Gitmo and get him home. Uh How do you feel about trading of POWs? I would would be willing to do it. I think the person that you're referring to has been over there for about four years now. I, bl- I believe it's five, five one more like yes. five years, yes. Yeah. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Yes, I, I would be willing, I mean, personally, personally, I, I think that we owe it to our people. We told them that we're not going to forget you. Right. And that, to me, is important when they say that, you know, we will never leave you behind. And so leave no man behind, As right? far as I'm concerned, those people at Gitmo, I don't know that they can get anything out of them that would be of any intelligence value to us at this point in time and I would be willing to trade him just to get our prisoner back yes. thank you yes well <coughs> excuse me my, my second question is um, after all these years looking back how do you feel about Vietnam it was a mistake it was a mistake all of the military schools <coughs> that I went through. I went through a military school when I was a, a lieutenant. And I went through a military school when I was a major. I went through another military school when I was a full colonel. And <clears throat> my view on it is that we did not have the responsibility <clears throat> to go into Vietnam and try to reestablish French control over Vietnam. Interesting. We did not, and, and particularly after uh, the DNB and Fu, I think that took place in 1954. Yes, it did, sir. And when they lost a lot of, they had a lot of their officers captured. Well, <clears throat> I still don't think that we have the responsibility to go in and to fight a war. It bothers me that we lost 58,000 young American lives. We have at least 300,000 severely injured. Some of them will require medical attention the rest of their lives. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And we spent a billion and a half dollars when a billion and a half dollars really amounted to something. It doesn't mean very much these days, but a billion and a half dollars. And look, just let me share a story with you to, sure. to tell you. I was in the Pentagon uh, I w- after I had the chance to command Williams Air Force Base. I went to the Pentagon. I was the director of tactical operations. One in 1975, April 1975. My boss, who was a three-star, said, I want you to go to the National Command Center. <clears throat> There's a group down there. They're working to get <clears throat> Vietnamese, South Vietnamese people out of South Vietnam and to put them on Air, uh, Navy vessels out in the South China Sea. There's about four to 6,000 of these people. We rounded them up, and we want to get them there. You go over, and the operation is in progress right now. I went over very shortly. (coughs) The Secretary of Defense came in. 
he had been to a cocktail party, still had on his tie and so forth. He took his jacket off, took his tie off, sat down. This is Dr. Schlesinger. The four-star commanders, they were all there. And uh, we had uh, secured, uh, secured phone lines over to the American Embassy in Saigon. I see. And at about 7 o'clock at night, I had a call from the duty officer at the White House, and he said, the president wants to know if Ambassador Martin has left Saigon yet. And I said, well, we can find out in just a few minutes. And I talked to Saigon. They said, Ambassador Martin is trying to help these people get on the helicopters. If, you know, that we, there's thousands of them, and, yes. and we have ships out there. We're taking them out. So <clears throat> the operation continued, and we had secure lines that we could more or less tell what was happening. Coming, this, these, this information was coming out of the U.S. Embassy in Saigon. Uh, <clears throat> probably at 11 o'clock I had another call from the same duty officer in the White House and he said the president would like to know if Ambassador Martin has left Saigon yet and I said I'll find out in just a minute when I talked to them they said Ambassador Martin has gone back to burn the American embassy he does not want that information to get into anyone's hands at about 2 o'clock, I had another call from the duty officer. The duty officer said, the president wants you to pass this information to Ambassador Martin. Tell him to get his butt on the next helicopter leaving Saigon. So I passed that, to, passed the that, I passed that to the, deb <laughs> to the uh, officer over in, in Saigon, never knowing that I'd ever see Ambassador Martin again in the late 1980s, I was at a Presbyterian church, Winston-Salem, for a service, and I looked over, sitting next to me was Ambassador Martin. I touched him on the shoulder, and I said, Sir, I'm Norm Gaddis. I was the guy who told you <laughs> to get your butt on the next that is, That's a great story. Leaving Saigon. Well, it is a true story. Yes, it, it is. It is a true story, and uh, we we laughed about it, and uh, but, you know, it it still bothers me even today when I look at the paper and I read all of these young people that were sacrificing in now in Afghanistan. Uh, it bothers me. It bothers me very much. I believe that we need to have a different foreign policy. Very interesting, sir. With your background, I really appreciate your honesty. And we, we have talked to a lot of Vietnam veterans, and with our group, part of our education was always going to the wall in D.C., was part of teaching Vietnam, was yeah. showing the supreme sacrifice. Yes. And when you go there, you talk to a lot of veterans. Yes. And they basically say the same thing mm -hmm. as you did, sir. Not as good as you did, but they say, it wasn't worth it, but I would do it again. I would serve my country if they asked oh, me. Oh, yes. Always. Yes. yes. But Vietnam was a mistake and let's learn from it, and I don't know if we have. I don't think we have. I don't think we have, personally. I don't think we have. Well, sir, on, on behalf of the North Carolina Vietnam Veterans and the Bridgeback Foundation, we have uh, started to wear these last couple of years to commemorate the POWs, their struggle, until they all come home. All right. We'd like to present you with one of these as a gift from us tonight. Fine. Thank you. Thank you. You're really welcome. Oh, and uh, Norman Gaddis, General Gaddis. Yes. Sir, all these <laughs> names. I'd like to thank you for being on the show tonight. I'm going to turn this over to Bill Dixon in a moment or two, but I have one, one last question. Yes. Okay. I don't have any more questions. Okay. <laughs> I, would, I would like to thank you, and I'd like you to let me email you or call you and give you contact information for Mr. Bill Schutte. Yes. Yes. And if you two decide to meet, uh -huh. Bill Dixon and I want to buy you lunch. <laughs> okay. Is that okay? Yeah. All right, yes. So it's been a pleasure and an honor to meet you. Fine, thank you. And share with our audience. Certainly a, an opportunity. I, I'm, I'm honored that you would ask me to come and be a part of this. Thank you very much. Yes.
Good evening. You are tuned to the Nissan Communications Network. Our weekly lineup of call-in programs includes Computers 2K Now with Amnon Nissan, Help In with Debbie Brooke, Breaking Free with Marilyn Shannon, Lessons of Vietnam with NCVVI members, The Tanya Love Show, Reawaken Your Brilliance with Julie Seibert, and if you tuned in too late, you can always watch each program in its entirety or download an MP3 audio file of it at www.nissancommunications.com. Sponsored by Atomus.com, makers of quality video recorders and converters for professionals. That vidblasterguy.com, carolinaapparel.com, and deltaforce.net. Thank you.